Instead of two. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> Acts chapter 23. Acts chapter 23 in our study of the book of Acts. Once again, the study of Acts. The key, the whole Bible will come alive when you understand the transition that occurs in the book of Acts. The transition from the church that Peter and the Twelve start in Acts chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Stoning of Stephen in Acts 7. To the salvation, the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ to Paul in Acts chapter 9. Paul gets saved. A new gospel to a new people. And it's a transition from the church that Peter and the Twelve started to the church that begins with Paul. He says, in me first. And that it's a pattern for them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Okay, so we're in Acts 23 in this study of the book of Acts. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said... Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest, and notice once again who he's in front of, the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. Whoa. Nothing like starting right out of the chute here in Acts 23. Um, the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. <clears throat> what did he say to do that? Verse 1, And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Whack! 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 I mean, what is going on here? Eric Brian's a little out of line here. Would you smite him in the face, please? In the mouth? I mean, <laughs> kind, of, kind of crazy, isn't it? Verse 3, Then Paul said unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. For sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to, meet, commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? And they that stood by said, Revelest thou God's high priest? I mean, man, are we getting into it here? You're going to back talk to the high priest? Wow. Then said Paul, I wish not, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. But when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. And when he had so said, there arose a dissemination between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. So Paul kind of, you got several things going on here, you know, with the high priest, um, uh, speaking bad to the high priest. Paul realizing the law, you know, says against that, and scripture says against that. However, the high priest has been contrary to law and having him smitten in the face. And then he, Paul realizes, okay, we've got the Sadducees over here, the Pharisees over here. I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees, I call. I'm the son of a Pharisee, and we do believe in the resurrection. They, the, the Sadducees, do not. And that was something that had been going on within the Jews, within the Jewish religion, um, since whenever. Um, some believe in the resurrection and some do not. And of course, plenty of Old Testament scripture about the resurrection out here at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to earth. Old Testament saints will be resurrected. That's when they inherit the land during the thousand year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ on earth. There is a resurrection of the dead of Old Testament saints at that time. Okay? A house divided shall not stand. And I, very good one. A house divided shall not stand. So Paul's kind of using this to his advantage here and starts playing this a little bit. Verse 9, And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees' part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man. Well, how about that? It worked pretty well, didn't it? Paul gets this going, and uh, yep, the, Pharisee, the scribes of the Pharisees come to back for him. 
Whoops, we find no fault in this man. <clears throat> okay, we find no evil in this man. But if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. Bring them all together. Look out, here we go. And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, <coughs> fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, I mean, get a visual of that. You got the Sadducees on one side, the Pharisees on the other side, and the captain's worried about them literally pulling Paul apart. Uh, in the middle of verse 10 now, uh, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. So, so the chief captain goes down there and by force takes Paul away from the two groups that physically have, have hold of Paul. Bring him into the castle. Verse 11, And the night following... And underline those next few words. The Lord stood by him and said. The Lord stood by him and said. Wow. I mean, really let that sink in. He said, wow. <laughs> if he didn't, he should have. Because I'd say, wow. No, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul. For as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also in, at Rome. Okay, and of course, if you go way back in Acts 9, when he was first saved, and that man's name was Ananias, um, that, was, that went to basically lay his hand on Paul for him to get his sight back. But it, actually, let's just go back and read that real quick. Acts chapter 9. There's three of them. This, this was the third in it yes. so far, right? So in Acts chapter 9 and verse 10, <laughs> there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision. And to him said the Lord in a vision. How about that? Man, would you be a special person or what if the Lord said in a vision to you? And he said, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. But if you come down... Well, let's just keep reading there. Uh, verse 12, And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in, and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath all authority, he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, and here's the things to do, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Okay, the three uh, main objectives, if you will, of the ministry of Paul uh, that, that's being laid out right here in Acts chapter 9. So this is the Lord speaking to Ananias to tell him to go put his hand on Paul to give him a sight back. But here's the three ministries I have for him. He's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name, in verse 15, to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. Okay, and that's exactly what is going on here in Acts 23 now, coming back to that. <clears throat> when he says at the end of verse 11, For as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. So we're kind of reversing the order now. <coughs> so the, okay. the, test, the, the testify that he's, done, that he's done so far would be, what he's testified would have been, that he's mentioned here, be of good cheer, uh, for as thou has, has testified to me in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. so must thou witness. Yeah, which would be all of 21 and 22, what he's been testifying in front of. Resurrection. Resurrection would be part of it, absolutely. And and everything we did back here in, in uh, 21 and 22, you know, like 22, he stands up, men, brethren, and fathers, 
Hear ye my defense which I make now unto you. Okay, and he gives his testimony in, in 22. But and he tells about his conversion experience on the road to Damascus. But any death uh, for the forgiveness of sins? Yes, because he gives his... He gives his... Yes, all of this. Absolutely. Yep, when he's giving his testimony and sharing the gospel of Christ as part of his testimony. Okay. Okay. So, 23, and now we're in verse 12. And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. Man, once again, the Jews, are they upset with Paul? I mean, <coughs> another group that's going to, that takes a, a um, uh, puts them, bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they killed Paul. Forty of them. Again, pretty amazing the, the commitment that people, some of the Jews continue to make to get this guy, Paul. And they were more than, oh, in the next verse, 13, and they were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy. So there you see, 40 of them. Okay, they ban, they, okay, so you see what's going on here. Verse 14, and they came to the chief priests and elders and said, we have bound ourselves under a great curse that we will eat nothing till we have slain Paul. Now therefore ye with the council signify to the chief captain that he bring him down unto you tomorrow, as though you would inquire something more perfectly concerning him. And we, or ever he come near, and we, or ever he come near, are ready to kill him. And when Paul's sister's son heard of their lying in wait, he went and entered into the castle and told Paul, Okay, so Paul's nephew overhears these 40 men conspiring with the chief priests. Okay, they're going to trick the captain, the chief captain, to bring Paul over, thinking that he's going to, they're going to ask more questions, right? And then we're going to, the 40 of us will be there lying in wait. We'll get him and kill him. All right, so they're conspiring to kill him with the leaders. Kind of ironic, too. Acts chapter 9, how did that start out? Paul went to who to get letters chief to the priest. synagogue? The chief priests. And here's the chief priests again. Now they're on the other side. So we have 40 men that died of starvation. Yeah, right. So, <laughs> But isn't that back something? In, the chief priests, once again, yes. Back in 9, verses 23, how much time had it expired, roughly? Since chapter 9. So 20 years? About 20 years. Okay. So it's not the same chief priest. Good, good point. Chances are it's the next, the next group of priests right behind them, if you will. I don't know that we know for sure. It doesn't matter, but my yeah. point yeah. was that... It is 20 years later. Yeah, was, you know, you're, you're working with a group in, in 20 years ago, yeah. and they're sending letters out to collect up Christians. Yeah. And now here you are, because you've changed, part of why they're probably going, what the heck? It's because this wasn't you 20 years ago. What's, up, yeah. what's going on? Yeah. I don't know. Although I would imagine there's some people that were probably part of the same mm -hmm. you know, leadership sure, ranks yeah. back then. There probably were some that were the same. You know, I don't know how often they changed the chief priest, you know, the, the numero uno guy, with the Paul, high priest. With Paul going back to Jerusalem each year, you think? No. Because the first three years he didn't. He went to, when he first got saved in Acts 9, he says in Galatians, when he talks about first getting saved, the appearing of Christ unto him, he went into the desert in Arabia for three years. He saw nobody. So we know for three years he went away. If nothing else. Okay, so this, um, just while we're here in verse 16, Paul's sister's son, his nephew, just write in the uh, margin out there, Colossians chapter 4, verse 10, and let's go over and take a look at it. We're going to put a name to this face. We'll see this guy pop up again. There you go. Thank you, Nick. In Colossians chapter 4... I'll start in verse 9. You just see he, Paul's referring to different people here. But, you know, with Onesimus, 
a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you. And Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas. Right there, Marcus, that's his nephew, the same guy back here in Acts chapter 23 that basically is going to warn the chief captain and save Paul. Is that John Marcus? Is it John Marcus? No, John Mark is the Apostle Mark. This is Marcus, okay. Paul's nephew. Okay. Yeah, John Mark, it would be the, the Apostle. Or the one, the one that wrote the book of Mark. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so Paul's sister, as he says in Colossians 4.10, and Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas. Okay? So anyway, back to Matthew, or Acts 23 now. So, and when Paul's sister's son heard of their lying in wait, he went in and entered into the castle and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions unto him. Centurions, the Green Berets, if you will, the, the Navy SEALs. These were the, the, the elite of the soldiers, the centurions. And said, Bring this young man unto the chief captain, for he hath a certain thing to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the chief captain, and said, Paul, the prisoner, called me unto him, and prayed me to bring this young man unto thee, who hath something to say unto thee. Then the chief captain took him by the hand, and went with him aside privately, and asked him, What is it that thou hast to tell me? And he said, The Jews have agreed to desire thee, that thou wouldest bring down Paul tomorrow into the council, as though they would inquire somewhat of him more perfectly. But do not thou yield unto them. This, this young boy talking to the chief captain. I mean, pretty brazen, if you will, for a young boy to talk to the chief captain this way, but he's pretty serious. But do not thou yield unto them, for there lie in wait for him of them more than forty men, which have bound themselves with an oath, that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now are they ready, looking for a promise from thee. So the chief captain then let the young man depart, and charged him, See thou tell no man that thou hast showed these things unto me. And he called unto him, and watch what he does here. And he called unto him two centurions, saying, Make ready two hundred soldiers to go unto Caesarea, and horsemen threescore and ten, seventy horsemen, and spearmen two hundred, at the third hour of the night, and provide them beasts, that they may set Paul on, and bring him safe unto Felix the governor. Did this chief captain take his role seriously of keeping Paul alive and getting him to Felix the, the governor? I mean, just look at that <clears throat> contingent that he put together. Two centurions, 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, 200 spearmen. I'd say he was pretty serious about it. Praise the Lord. <coughs> oh, wow. I mean, he didn't fool around. He understood. I mean, he saw firsthand what was going on to begin with when the Sadducees and the Pharisees you know, were going at it. So he witnessed that firsthand, took him out of there, by force it said, if you recall. So now he's got all these men. So we got close to 500 <coughs> protecting Paul on his way to Felix. Romans. The governor. Verse 25, And he wrote a letter after this matter. Claudius Lysias, unto the most excellent governor Felix, sendeth greeting. This man was taken of the Jews, and should have been killed of them. Then came I with an army and rescued him. So already they should have killed him once, having understood that he was a Roman. And, would I, and when I would have known the cause wherefore they accused him, I brought him forth into their council, whom I perceived to be accused of questions of their law. But to have nothing laid to his charge worthy of death or of bonds. And when it was told of me how that the Jews laid wait for this man, once again, a second time they're going to kill him. Laid wait for this man. I sent straightway to thee and gave commandment to his accusers also to say before thee what they had against him. Farewell. 
Okay, so he writes this letter, sends it with the soldiers <coughs> and with Paul to Felix, the governor. Okay, they want to kill him. I put him before the council to judge him by their law. I, I saw no fault worthy of death. So I'm sending them to you because they're trying to kill him again. So you hear this, and the witnesses are going to come and have court at your place. All right, they're moving it to the next court, if you will. So this is they've the, appealed it in a sense, like today. This would be the principalities and powers in high places. We're moving higher and higher each time. That's exactly what's going to happen here but through the rest Satan. of the Book of Acts. Is that what you were saying? No, nobody touches Satan. <laughs> Michael the Archangel. You know, before kings, yeah. right? And so he's getting closer right. to the governor now. And then we're going to see him in a future chapter go another level higher to the next higher court, next higher right. political leader. Right. Right. So he's going right to the top. And he gets to the top by Acts 28. Okay? So he ends the uh, letter in verse 30. Farewell. So 31. Then the soldiers, as it was commanded them, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. On the morrow they left the horsemen to go with him, and returned to the castle, who, when they came to Caesarea, and delivered the epistle to the governor, presented Paul also before him. Okay, so they give Felix a letter, deliver Paul, and when, verse 34, and when the governor had read the letter, he asked of what province he was. And when he understood that he was of Cilicia, I will hear thee, said he, so my court has jurisdiction over you. You're from Cilicia? Okay, we can hold court here. Just like today, that's one of, always one of the questions. Which court has jurisdiction over the matter at hand? You know, is this a matter of uh, county law? Is this state law? Is this federal? Should this be in federal court? Should it be in the state of Texas? Or, you know, this is a dispute between somebody here in, in Texas and somebody in Louisiana, which court has and which law has jurisdiction? Okay, that's always a question. So when he understood he was of Cilicia, verse 35, I will hear thee, said he, when thine accusers are also come. Okay, they, they've got to get here, then we'll have court. And he commanded him to be kept in Herod's judgment hall. So he puts him in a place of safekeeping. Herod's judgment hall. Okay, you see we're moving up there one, Brian. You know, one level higher. Yeah. But uh, that's, that is the whole plan here, to get Paul in front of kings, and he's going to get in front of King Herod eventually. So everybody is going to hear Paul's eyewitness account. You know, chapter 26 is one of the other very good accounts of Paul giving his uh, personal testimony from Acts chapter 9. He's going to tell Herod what happened back there in Acts chapter 9. And so 22 and 26 are the two times that Paul gives an accounting of his conversion experience, his testimony. And that's where when you put all three accounts together, Acts 9, Acts 22, and Acts 26, the two times that Paul talks about the Acts 9 accounting, then you put the whole picture together about the men that were with him hearing a voice but not understanding the words that were said. But you have to have all three of those passages to put that together, of Paul not just binding people and putting them in handcuffs and bringing them back to Jerusalem was his intent in Acts 9, but the fact that he actually had them committed to death. Again, you need all three of the stories put together to get the full picture. He actually had them put to death. Christians. Consent. Yeah, I, I was consenting unto their death. Thank you. Is the exact way that the Bible words it there. How but he old said, was he in nine? In nine, he was probably young thirties. Um, we don't know for sure, but just putting it all together, he was. Pro most people feel he was probably young thirties, maybe even right at thirty. But he was, man. He was the man. He was the he was the leader of the band back there. You know, he was the one when they stoned Stephen in Acts seven. They all came and laid their clothes at Paul's feet, right? He was the ringleader. I mean, he was he was the man. He was a young leader at 30, but a leader nonetheless, if you will. <laughs> Had to get that in. 
Okay, so it, it, that's why it's always you, you compare Scripture with Scripture and putting all of those together. And then bringing in his account in Galatians chapter 1 where he talks... Go, go to Galatians 1. Since we have just a few minutes here. A quick chapter. In Galatians 1 where Paul talks about what he did back there. So Galatians 1... Verse 11, where he says, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, Paul did not get his gospel from Peter and the Twelve, contrary to what most churches would be teaching this morning. They always they want Paul to take the same gospel. No, he learned it by direct revelation of Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 9. Now, watch what he says down here. Come down to verse 16, verse 15, to put a little context with it. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace to reveal His Son in me, back there in Acts 9, that I might preach Him among the heathen, immediately, how quickly? Immediately, I conferred not with flesh and blood. I did not go see Peter, okay? I conferred not with flesh and blood, verse 17, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia and returned again unto Mat to Damascus, then after three years. So for three years he goes away. Brian, this is what we were talking about earlier. Three years he goes away into the desert in Damascus. He does not see Peter in the twelve. He does not learn anything from them. It is by direct revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot miss that. That's why you put compare script, Scripture with Scripture, compare spiritual things with spiritual things. Put the whole story together that way. Comment? So, yeah, it's like he, uh, he forsook his religion. Oh, he absolutely forsook his religion because he was doing it in the name of religion. That's why he went to, at the beginning of Acts 9, he goes to the chief priest to get letters of permission. So the chief priest gave him a letter that said, I hear, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, I hereby give this guy, Saul of Tarsus, permission to throw everybody in jail that's following, the Bible said, this way, which would have been the doctrine that Peter and the Twelve were teaching. Anybody that's following Peter and the Twelve, hey, let Saul take them in handcuffs back to Jerusalem. We're going to put them in court and try them and put them to death for blasphemy. I would imagine that when he uh, <clears throat> lost his eyesight until the time he got his eyesight back, his heart was totally, well, it's trans transformed, obviously. But yeah. all his thoughts and uh, zealous nature prior to that were wiped out of his head that he was moving forward with. Yeah, you can only imagine if the Lord Jesus Christ Himself appeared to you. Uh, you say, "Whoa, what's going on here?" Because Paul never questioned who it was in Acts nine. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? He knew who it was that was dealing with him. So you had the Roman government, the centurions, all of that. And then you also had within the religious system their own yes uh, warfare party. Absolutely, own. yes, absolutely. Two different, very distinct groups. Absolutely, good These point. These two groups have pitted themselves against each other, and the Romans are evidently overruling what is coming in check with the. Uh, I wouldn't Romans. say he's pitted. They're pitted against each other. They're they're each trying. It, it's very much like the crucifixion of Christ. You know, if you think about Pilate. You know, he realized this man is not what he's done, nothing worthy of death. And he's trying to get the Jews, you know, you judge him by your law then, because I find nothing worthy of death. So, you, same thing here with Paul. Like we just read in chapter 23, I find nothing worthy. This guy's not guilty of anything. They're, you know, I've got them, the Jews, the, the Jewish leaders, council, um, trying them by their law, is how he worded it, by Jewish law. Right. And so now I'm passing them on to you, Felix, to a higher court, Roman, Roman court, but have the Jews come in and they're going to be the ones that testify against him. 
So they're not necessarily pitted against each other, <coughs> but, neither, but, but the Romans definitely are not seeing him as guilty of anything, and so they're trying to get the Jews, but allow the Jews according to law. If he wouldn't have been a Roman, Exa he had already been gone. Exactly. That's the key right there. He had to have been a Roman, or he was toast. He would have been already dead for sure. Yes, sir? Uh, going back to what George said concerning the three years... Oh, I mean, not three years, but the, uh, the blindness. Mm -hmm. before. Three days of blindness. Yeah, yeah, the, the three days of blindness. And him, uh, in his mind, all the previous learning mm -hmm. and all his thought process, like, changing. Mm -hmm. You know, I think of how it is today with uh, people who are under traditionalism, uh -huh. mainstream theology, and then getting... The sound right, doctrine right. of right division, and then it's like, wow! No. And you, I gotta forget everything that I learned, relearn it, and it's like all the scripture that you know, you try to start really piecing together uh, correctly. Yeah, good point. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, there so I can see how Paul would be like, man, I know all this scripture. Well, how does that really work? Yeah. You know. And for us, having the full knowledge of I think it, I hope, did y'all hear what he said back there okay? That, that's an excellent point. I think for the camera, I want to just kind of go on that for a minute. Equate that to today. People, you know, so many people have grown up in a certain denomination, um, whichever one that might be. And so, and, and again, virtually every denomination is, is, has plenty of scripture to support their beliefs. The problem is, so many of them are not dispensational in what they're applying. And I'll just use as a for instance. Acts chapter 2, we have Peter and the Twelve talking in tongues. So you have many denominations today that want to say, see, we should be talking in tongues and healing like they are in Acts 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Well, it's scriptural for that to have happened. But it ended. Paul said clearly those things would come to end, and they do at the end of the book of Acts. Okay, so it, it's scriptural, but it's not dispensational to apply that to today. Now, the point that's being made here very well, just like Paul, he, he was grounded in Jewish doctrine. I mean, he was a, a, um, uh, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Thank you, I want to get the exact term. Paul says, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, exceedingly zealous of the law. I mean, he knew the law, he kept the law, he studied at the feet of Gamaliel. I mean, he, he was well grounded in Jewish law. And that's why he was out there doing what he thought was right in the name of religion in Acts 7, 8, and 9, when, they, when he's throwing the people that are following, going, they're straying from Jewish custom and law to follow Peter and the Twelve with this new doctrine. So Paul, in the name of religion, think of the religious wars going on today, is throwing them in jail, having them put to death. In the name of religion. And then, while he's going there to do some more, the Lord Jesus Christ appears to him and shows him an even new doctrine, the Gospel of Christ. How that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and was buried and raised again for our justification. And Paul says, in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him unto life everlasting. Amen. Wow. So yes. So so in this instant Paul is blinded. Now we're going to suppose some of this because the Bible doesn't tell us clearly. So therefore and so I just want to point that out. What I'm about to say is not the Bible saying this, but can you just imagine those 3 days? And Paul knew it was the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? He knew right away who was appearing unto him. And to have to undo everything that he had been following and this new doctrine. And by the way, not just three days, but very quickly, he goes away for three years. And we have no accounting, no accounting in the Bible of the next three years of Paul. So just imagine what he sure. may have been learning during this time period. Or unlearning. And unlearning. Or rightly dividing. Yeah. All, well, that's the thing, and and right just like people today, 
is is the point that's being made now. So you grow up, and, and, it, and I'm just using popular names, okay? Whether it was, you know, Catholic or Baptist or Presbyterian, you know, a mainstream denomination, or if it was an offstream denomination. The point is, when you see the scriptures rightly divided, I was sharing this uh, yesterday. I never forget. You know, I'd been going to, to Brother Jerry Lockhart's study for all of you know a month or two. I just remember I'd been there. It was the fourth week there. And I said, Jerry, time out. You keep using this term, rightly divided. What do you mean by that? And it was like somebody playing volleyball, you know, and here's the, here's the set, spike it down my throat, you know. But I wanted to know. But in 10 minutes, he just went back to a couple basic scriptures, and it was like, duh. It's so obvious. But I had grown up in a specific denomination. My dad was choir director, so we were there every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, opening the church doors, locking the church doors at the end. I mean, we were always there. So I knew the Bible from that denomination's perspective. And by the way, there's no eternal security in that denomination. But when you, but when you see it, and so same thing, you know, I, I would put myself as no different than than anybody else, and in that, wow, now I've got to unlearn everything I, I've been learning for 20 years or whatever. Like, like Paul's doing here, like the comment that was made, you know, from the, from the front couch over here, uh, for the camera's sake. Um, but great point, great point. Sometimes we've got to unlearn some old stuff, some old baggage, so that the new stuff can take place. You know, Please. some of the uh, uh, really like stuff as it. far as what he was talking about, people who are introduced to rightly dividing, whether it's you've been involved in Catholicism, Baptist, whatever it is, you know, the revelation that you get is not something of having to unlearn. It's a revelation of a truth that you see jump off the page. And it's not like, oh, Pastor Bob told me this, and so he must be right. And then you see this jump off the page as you start to rightly divide. It's like, Pastor Bob is of no consequence. It's right here in the book. Yes. And in a point I really want to emphasize for the camera's sake, in case somebody's not here today, I'm going to read right out of Acts 17 to emphasize the point that was just made here. Because this is such a key point for all good Bible students. You've got to follow what George just said right there. And it's Acts 17. You know, why does Brother Jerry Lockhart call his church Berean Bible Church? It's this passage, verses 10, 11, and 12 of Acts 17. 1710. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble. Now these Jews... These students are the ones that are more noble. Okay, these students of the Bible were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they were, here's why, in that they received the word that Paul spoke with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Even when the apostle Paul came and talked to them and spoke to them, they heard it and they accepted it but they went and searched the scriptures daily to make sure whether those things Paul said were true and in accordance with the scripture. And when they were, verse 12, therefore many of them believed. And that's the key point. Do not believe it until you've seen it in the scripture clearly. And you see that it is for your dispensation, for our dispensation today. That it is in accordance with scripture. Just because Steve says something up here, just because George says something from the floor, or Mike does, or Brian, or, or because Jerry Lockhart was here and you heard him preach it, you've got to see it in the scripture. And Jerry would say the same thing to you. Okay, now we're obviously we're not going to say something we know is wrong, but it's got to be in the scripture. And that's what George is saying there. The key is you see it in the scripture, that's when it should jump out. And just get ingrained in your head, ingrained in your heart, and your body and soul and spirit and everything that you are. That yes, that's what I believe because it says, you know, thus saith the scripture. Amen. And I would highly encourage you that, that that ought to be stuck between Romans and Philemon. 
Okay, you can't go wrong if you're in Romans to Philemon. Are there things in other parts of the Bible that, that apply to us today? Absolutely. All Scripture, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is profitable. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. All Scripture. But Romans to Philemon, you can count on all of that being to you. Not all of the Scripture prior to the book of Romans and after the book of Philemon is to you. Much of it is, is very different doctrine for a different people for a different time period. Hebrews through Revelation, that seven-year period of great tribulation, that's the doctrine for that time period. And those Jews will understand that, and they will see that in the Scriptures, and it's going to jump off the pages, just like rightly dividing does to you. Just like reading that Paul is your apostle. When Paul says, consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Okay? All. 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 In all means, all. Thank you. All right. Great study this morning. For a short chapter, we got a lot in there, brother.